you've discovered some fossils and you have a good sense of what the date is on those fossils. The discovery of those fossils is of course a cause for much celebration, particularly if they're very good fossils. And yet the discovery of those fossils also entails with it a set of questions. The most basic question of that is simply, what is this? Now, one answer to that question of what is this is has to do with species identification. What kind of organism is this? We'll get to that in a little bit, but what I want to begin discussing is how you answer that question, what is this, with what does this do? What is the function of this fossil? How might we reconstruct function or patterns of behavior from a specific fossil? Now we've already talked about this a little bit in talking about how morphology dictates function to some degree. We talked about this, for example, when we were talking about differences in human and ape anatomy. The large canines in the gorilla, the huge area for the temporalis muscle, and the sagittal and compound sagittal and occipital crest all indicate what kind of behaviors we see from gorillas. We see large chewing muscles. We see large dental structures that correspond to those large chewing structures. The discovery of a fossil with a large sagittal crest like this is indicative of the fact that we can then reconstruct that fossil to have a large temporalis muscle associated with that crest, and thereby large chewing muscles, and in general a large mascatory apparatus or chewing apparatus. So in some cases that correlation between form and function is quite straightforward. In other ways, morphology is uh, more subtle in how it presents evidence of function. As an example, we can consider the human leg. Now we've already been introduced to the fact that the human skeletal anatomy reflects throughout its entire construction the evidence for bipedality. The fact that humans habitually walk on two feet and that's our primary mode of locomotion. Nowhere is that more apparent than in the human leg. To try and reconstruct that, however, there are several steps to go through in thinking about how morphology is indicative of function. When we look at the human lower limb, in this case we have the femur, the tibia and fibula, and then the bones of the ankle and foot, our goal is to really try to imagine how this would have existed within an organism, and how it would have acted within the life of that organism. One of the first steps of that is trying to think about the soft tissue that goes along with these hard tissue structures. Basically trying to think about how the muscles and other soft tissue attachments would have operated these. This can be seen as kind of a first order reconstruction of function. So if we consider the human lower limb, the femur, tibia, fibula, bones of the ankle, bones of the foot, we can actually try and reconstruct the morphology and function of this combination of bones. This feature that we know to be part of a combined unit known as the lower limb or the leg of an individual. Now we can begin by looking specifically at the femur as a way of trying to reconstruct how the morphology of the femur tells us something about its function. Now in this case, in the position that I'm holding it right here, with the two condyles on the distal end of the femur flat against the ground, we can see that the bone itself, the shaft coming up, and then the neck of the femur, the section coming off right here, which articulates with the pelvis, is sitting at a particular angle. This angle is what we refer to as the bicondylar angle, referencing those two starting points of that measurement, which are the two condyles on the distal end. Now in humans, the bicondylar angle again displaces the proximal part of the femur away from the midline of the body, and brings the lower part of the femur towards the midline of the body. The reason it does this, and what we can reconstruct in terms of behavior out of this, is that humans are bipeds. During our bipedal walk, we put all of the weight of our body essentially onto one leg and we need to stay upright and not fall over. One of the ways we do to assist our body in that function is by bringing our weight closer to our midline. One of the ways we do that is by bringing our knees close to our midline. If we were to contrast this femur with that of a chimpanzee or another great ape, we'd find that in the same position, the femur would be much more upright or straight. Since they're quadrupeds primarily, apes have their limbs laterally relative to their body. They don't have the same need to bring their weight underneath towards the midline of their body. So the basic shape of this bone reveals part of its function in the sense that it dictates how we bring weight closer to our midline because of our bipedal stance and because of our bipedal gait. There are other aspects of this femur that we can use to interpret behavior. For example, if we look at the proximal end of the femur and we look at the posterior view, we can see a number of big knobby attachments to this bone. These are actually muscular attachment sites, and they're muscles that are associated again with bipedal locomotion. These are muscular attachment sites where during bipedalism, there are strong muscular forces that help stabilize the pelvis and the hips, basically stabilize the body so it doesn't fall over to one side, and that provide primary propulsion to your body as you move through your bipedal gait. 
So again, if we know something about the soft tissue corresponding with these hard tissue structures, in this case the primary muscles that articulate here, we can interpret some of the behavior illustrated by this specimen. Now, some of what this bone tells us about behavior isn't readily visible by just looking at its surface. We also can use technology such as x-rays or even these days CT scans to look at the internal morphology of the bone. And oftentimes that internal morphology can be very valuable for reconstructing patterns of behavior. If we were to compare again how humans regularly load their femur, which is to say how their muscles regularly act to move and exert forces through the femur, it contrasts to how a chimpanzee, for example, regularly loads its femur. Chimpanzees load their femur in a lot of different directions and angles. When they're climbing trees, when they're walking bipedally on the ground, when they're walking in a quadrupedal stance. Humans, we tend to habitually load our femur in only one direction, basically. We load it when we're walking. We put our leg in front of us, we extend our leg behind us, and we repeat that cycle many, 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 many times throughout the day, all, for the most part, in an upright posture. This means that we regularly create a force environment on both the external and the internal structures of this bone. Now it turns out the internal structures of bone have at least some capacity to remodel or reshape themselves with respect to the enforced environment that's placed upon them. So by habitually loading, for example, our femoral neck in a specific way, we create a specific expected distribution of bone within the femoral neck. So that if we were to look at an x-ray or a CT scan of the femoral neck of this specimen, we would expect to, it turns out, see an asymmetrical pattern of bone distribution that reflects the kind of force environment that's placed upon this bone. In contrast, if we were to compare that to a similar x-ray or CT scan of a chimpanzee or another great ape, a great ape that, again, habitually loads the femur in a variety of different angles, we'd find that we'd find more or less symmetrically distributed bone, as opposed to the asymmetrically distributed pattern of bone that we see in humans. That asymmetrical distribution of bones that we see in humans is therefore indicative of the fact that we basically are specialized bipedal walkers. So if we take a step back then and think about how this bone can tell us about function, there are a number of different things we can look at. We can look at its primary shape and architecture as indicative of what role it serves within the larger skeleton of this specimen. We can look at specific morphology and specific features. How large are they? How are they distributed? How do they compare to how those features look like in other related organisms? And finally, we can look at the internal morphology of the bone to try and reconstruct habitual patterns of force or habitual force environments in which this bone is loaded in. All of these can reveal aspects of function and behavior simply by the form of the bone itself and how the morphology is presented. Now again, if we imagine ourselves finding a fossil, it's unlikely to be a fossil as well preserved as this cast right here. Likely it might just be a fragment, but that fragment might preserve important evidence in the form of specific morphological features or even internal morphology that allow us to try and reconstruct evidence of behavior from simply that fragment of a fossil.